when we talk about what can I do for my child or what are the conversations I should be having at home with my ninth or 10th grader, of course, it's obvious to talk about the importance of them keeping up their grades and doing their schoolwork. But it's also engaging your son or daughter in conversations about what are their interests? What are their curiosities? And I always hesitate to use the word passion. Certainly some students have a passion, sometimes multiple, but I think even there's a lot of adults in the world who may not have a passion. And that's why I try to take that pressure off of students when we have those conversations. Welcome to Tilt Parenting, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm Debbie Reber, your host, and today is an important episode for listeners with kids in middle school or high school because we are going to be talking about university admissions. I've done a few episodes in the past touching upon post-secondary education, one with Elizabeth Hamlet on managing the transition from high school to college, one on how our kids can identify and get into colleges and universities that will work for them, and most recently, an episode taking us inside a college for neurodiverse students, Landmark College. But this week, we are going to get into the nitty gritty of the application process and learn about things like strategies for tackling admissions essays, how to decide between the SAT and the ACT, getting accommodations for those admissions tests, how to highlight interests in a way that will catch admissions directors' eyes, and more. And to fill us in on all of this is my guest, Eric Carlin. He's a college essay and application consultant and the founder of The Ivy Experience, a company that works with families to prepare students for their collegiate futures through test prep, tutoring, and essay consultation. Eric also recently gave a TEDx talk called What Do I Need to Know About You?, in which he talked about the benefits for anyone of any age embracing and expressing their answer to that question, not just for interviews and applications or even personal and professional relationships, but for happiness and well-being. In this episode, Eric gives us a lot of insight into the application process and I have to say that rather than ramping up the anxiety here, I found myself feeling more calm and trusting and at peace about the college application process. So I hope it does the same for you. And don't forget to tune in to next week's episode. I am so excited to be sharing a very special conversation with Dr. William Stixrude and Ned Johnson, co-authors of one of the most powerful parenting books I've ever read, The Self-Driven Child. This is a longer than usual episode that packs a punch. So be sure to check that out. I can't wait to share it with you. Thank you so much. And now here is my conversation with Eric. Hey, Eric, welcome to the podcast. Good morning, Debbie. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for coming on to enlighten us a little more about high school students who are looking to go to college and kind of that application process. And it seems very overwhelming. I can say even as a parent of a child going into high school, it's, it's in the back of my mind, like, oh, it's time to start kind of thinking about planning. And I don't even really know where to start. So um, I'm sure there are many people listening to this, who are going to be very curious and taking notes on this conversation. So as a way to get into it, can you take a few minutes to introduce yourself and tell us about your work in the world? Sure. So I've been doing this since 2010. Uh, in college, I actually individualized my major. Uh, in, in The major was called Journalism, History, and Culture, uh, but graduated in 2009 in the heart of the recession when magazines and newspapers were cutting freelance budgets. And uh, I had always been also interested in education. And uh, I got into this world by starting to work with students and families on the application and application essay process. At the same time, uh, my now business partner, uh, he was a biomedical engineering major who decided he didn't want to be a doctor. And he was doing SAT and ACT prep right after graduation. And the two of us were sitting together uh, one day a few months after graduating. And we said, 
why aren't these two elements both offered together by you know companies so they can you know a company like ours can really develop a meaningful relationship and connection with the family and in theory work with them throughout the whole high school experience leading up to college and we started this in March in 2010 and now we're talking I can't believe I'm saying that it'll be our 10 year anniversary next yeah. March which is which is wild but we've worked with students in 35 states and 20 countries on everything ranging from SAT and ACT prep to college essays and applications. And it's been an incredible ride the past almost decade. That's really impressive um, and resourceful. I imagine that must have been a really hard time to come out of college and, and kind of face the current economic and work situation. So so good on you for, for making that happen. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. Okay, so we're going to talk about college application, the process. And gosh, there's so many things. We have a list of questions here. And I, I'm, I'm not even sure quite where to start here. And I would say that that's totally okay. And that's a normal thought heading into this process as a parent or a student uh, just starting the high school process. But I will say that just having the conversation and Having a roadmap to navigating this whole process is really more than half the battle. And I always say not just achieving success or your goals, but really in saving you and your family time, energy, money, and stress. Knowing is more than half the battle. And when we do seminars and webinars for families and we talk about you know how to navigate the process, when I am t- talking with ninth grade parents and 10th grade parents and even eighth grade parents, I always try to emphasize that we want to have these conversations, not from a place of intensity, but really just from a place of knowing so that we can you know, take away the anxiety and uncertainty that is surrounds this process in so many ways. Well, can you say more about that? What do you mean from a place of knowing? Sure. So I know one thing uh, you and I had chatted about discussing was uh, the SAT and ACT, which, which are scary tests in themselves for you know many students and families, and especially when we're talking about uh, differently differently wired children who may be uh, thinking about or having to apply for accommodations for the test. What's important is to know how to navigate that process. And having conversations early uh, to figure out the timeline and trajectory that your student is on is pretty essential. For instance, uh, when we talk about the SAT and ACT, and actually just to take a half step back, um, these are the two standardized tests that you need to take for college. You don't need to take both. Every college and university looks at them completely equally. So you only need to take one or the other. And one thing that my company has always emphasized to students and families is to take a diagnostic test of each one just to get a baseline score to figure out what test is right for your student. Um, In some cases, students score pretty much the same on both tests. Uh, But in other cases, there are students who score significantly better on one test versus the other. For instance, when I was in high school, I was doing fine on the SAT. And I grew up in Connecticut, where all we ever knew was the SAT. And I was on a college visit at Brown University, and um, speaking with someone there, and we were having a conversation. And she said, well, have you ever looked at the ACT? And the reality was, I had never even heard of the ACT. And she assured me that every single college looks at them completely equally. I went back home and I took a practice ACT and scored the equivalent of over 200 points better than I ever had on the SAT. And this is, you know, I always use that story and emphasizing that point, knowing how to navigate this process and the rules to the game can be more than half the battle. When we talk about differently wired students, though, who may be applying for accommodations, there's a whole another set of rules and uh, things to navigate. 
So when we talk about applying for accommodations, with the SAT, the company, uh, the non- not-for-profit that does the SAT is called College Board. You can apply for accommodations at any time through College Board. Um, your school's SSD coordinator or guidance counselor can submit the educational and psychological testing and history of accommodations. And it's pretty straightforward. But when you are applying for accommodations on the ACT, you actually have to register for a test date. And it's these subtle nuances that are important to navigate. When we talk about, you know, going back to what I was saying before about the importance of taking a diagnostic test to figure out what test is right for you, when you consider that you may qualify or get accommodations on one test versus the other, it really underscores the need to figure out what your accommodations are for your student before, forget tutoring or studying on your own, before you even take a baseline test. Um, I have used the analogy, if you're trying to figure out if your child is good at basketball, you don't start by telling them to start uh, shooting hoops on a 15 foot rim, when in reality, it's a 10 foot hoop. That's not gonna be an indication of how they're gonna play and how they're gonna succeed. So it's small things like having conversations early with 10th grade parents and saying, you should consider registering for a test even with no intention of taking it for the ACT, just so that you can figure out what the accommodations are and you can plan accordingly. Because you can always pay to uh, switch the test date to a later date. So it's small things like that, that you know, are really important to understand. And it's why it's great having this conversation early. So just a few kind of little technical questions. To take a diagnostic test, is that something that's available online? How does one even go about doing that? So there's lots of ways to do it. Um, For my company, we will actually, uh, for any family that reaches out to us, we send an SAT and ACT diagnostic test. Um, to families for them to take, and then we grade and evaluate them for free. Um, But you can also get SAT and ACT diagnostic tests. Most often, if you go to the guidance department's office, they should have practice booklets. You can download tests from College Board for the SAT and then the ACT as well and take them on your own. Um, I've always emphasized to families, there's lots of ways to get those tests and to get a baseline of both, but it's just important that you do it in any one of those ways. And is there an ideal grade or age that students would, you know, start this process, take that first practice test or the diagnostic test? I generally say at some point by the end of sophomore year. Uh, So uh, there's a lot of high schools in the country that will offer the PSAT or practice SAT. in the fall of 10th grade. Uh, Some will also offer the PACT. Now those are tests that, again, are more for practice. They don't actually get submitted to colleges at all. Um, But I would say by the end of 10th grade to have a baseline of both, because I'd say the earliest that students do begin any sort of um, SAT and ACT prep is the summer between 10th and 11th grade assuming they have all the content and they're they're ready to take that on, it's a great time to do, uh, to start studying because, you know, unlike 11th grade junior year where it's the most rigorous academic year that students have had and there's lots of other commitments and, you know, extracurricular activities going on, the summertime is often slower. And there's never a great time to start preparing and studying for the SAT and ACT. Uh, So it's, as as I've joked over the years, it's finding the least worst time to study (laughs) for it. Uh, In in the summer, oftentimes presents a great opportunity for students to do that. I just have to confess in listening to this, when I, back in the day, when I was in high school, I know I had friends who took classes or studied, I just kind of showed up and took the test. It seems like 
it's such a different climate now than it was maybe than many of our listeners were were going through this process. Um, it's just interesting for me to recognize how much preparation goes into this and that you can actually study and you can you can practice and and learn strategies for taking these tests that can really impact your score. It's true. And actually, what's interesting, uh, I'll throw a question at, at you. Do you know what SAT stands for? A standardized admissions test? So it, it used to stand for scholastic aptitude test. Yeah. And in the 90s, that actually went away because they determined that the SAT wasn't actually measuring aptitude at all. So believe it or not, the acronym SAT stands for absolutely nothing now. <laughs> it's just a branding acronym uh, because it's really a test that tests how well you do on the SAT. And when we talk about the SAT and ACT, they are, they're, they're obviously testing material that high school students should know. But what's interesting is when you really break down the content on each section of the test, you know, for instance, on the ACT, um, there's four sections, English, math, reading, and science. And when we talk about English, it's grammar, which we know that high school classes they're not exclusively focused on teaching grammar. And then you have math, which covers pre-algebra, algebra one, algebra two, geometry, and some very basic level trig and pre-calc. Reading is just reading a passage and answering questions about the passage. And the science section is the one that sounds, it is a bit deceiving in name because you really don't need to know science to do the science section. It's actually just uh, interpreting graphs and data that happens to have science as, as I joke, you know, science or scientific <laughs> terms on the graphs. So it's, it's a skill set for sure, but it's not uh, that you need to take chemistry or that you need to take U.S. history uh, to do well in the SAT and ACT. We'll be right back after this quick break. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. During this month of planning and organization for big transitions, rhythms and routines have been absolutely essential for our physical and emotional well-being. So Green Chef nights are reliably and predictably a good night. We know the ingredients will be fresh and prepped, the instructions easy to follow, and the meal delicious. We're all still talking about last week's turkey tacos with mango chimichurri sauce, refried beans, and Monterey Jack cheese. Green Chef contributes to a healthy lifestyle with easy and delicious menus like fresh seasonal salads and grain bowls, and with over 80 weekly meal and market options, plus rotating options to suit a variety of lifestyles, whether Mediterranean, plant-based, calorie-smart, keto, protein-packed, gluten-free, there are always plenty of options to choose from. Whatever you select, you'll get farm-fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins all delivered straight to your door. I love those four words, straight to my door. Oh, and one more thing I love about Green Chef, they have an app, which means it's easy to manage meal preferences and delivery from your phone if you want to. And 
I, for one, want to. I am in that mode where I'm making the most of little moments like waiting in line at the pharmacy or for the F train to pull into the station to tackle all of those to-dos. So the convenience of an app is key for me. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash Tilt50 and use code Tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code Tilt50 at greenchef.com slash Tilt50. Okay, a couple more questions about these tests, and then we'll move on to other topics. One, I'm just curious, are there schools that don't require one of these tests? Or is it pretty standard across the board? So a a growing movement that we're seeing at universities across the country is uh, what we call test optional schools, uh, where students have the option of submitting the SAT and ACT, but they also have the option to not submit their standardized tests and then be considered holistically, you know, with no standardized tests. Many times if you choose the test optional option, there's could be an additional writing re- requirement or you need to submit a research paper. There's just something else to take its place on the application. Um, there's, as you can imagine, so many parents and students who are very excited when they hear about the universities, the increasing number each year that become test optional. The one word of caution in, you know, awareness that I share with families, though, is you can certainly take that, take advantage of that, that test optional system, but you really need to have strong grades. You, you can't have grades that are towards the middle or below the 50th percentile for a university's accepted students and then not submit the standardized scores as well. When we talk about what's most important on any college application, and they really do look at students holistically, but by far and away, the most important factor on admissions is grades, and even significantly more than test scores, but grades in what we call academic rigor, which is how much a student may be challenged in themselves in their high school curriculum with honors or AP or IB classes. The grades are the most important. So test optional is great, but you need the grades to establish, you know, your student's academic background at that point. Okay, that's good to know. So I I wanted to just, before we move on, also just talk about accommodations. So you talked earlier about that roadmap and getting that process started and figuring out what kind of accommodations uh, you might be able to get for a child. I'm wondering what some of the more typical accommodations are. And I'm also just, you know, knowing the college admissions scandal um, (laughs) that has recently been everywhere in the news. I'm just curious, your personal take is, is that going to make it harder for kids who truly need accommodations to get them? It's certainly a possibility that that may be what happens. But the one thing that I've always emphasized to families who even before that scandal, who are worried if their students going to qualify and get approved for the accommodations or not, is talking a lot about, uh, you know, having a history of accommodations that they can show and send to college board for the SAT and then for the ACT. Um, Having that history is pretty essential. and, And for the students who need it, they really do get it when there's that history in place. As far as the accommodations themselves, there's a wide variety of them. The most important uh, or the most common accommodation is extra time, which usually comes in the form of what they call 50% extra time. So basically multiply the time limits on each section by you know one and a half. Then from there, there's like I said, a wide variety, everything from ranging uh, to taking the test over numerous days uh, to taking the test in a small group testing environment or having an individual proctor who may read the questions out loud or can serve as a scribe for the student, um, having larger print, st- having the ability to start and stop the clock, um, 
there's more, but that gives you a good idea of what the different accommodations may be. And for those who are listening, who are homeschooling their children, which I'm raising my hand, I'm one of them. You know, a lot of us don't have IEPs that are current because some some have never had their child in school um, and some have ended up pulling their child out after some failed school experiences. So have you worked with parents who have homeschooled who don't have that kind of uh, lengthy track record to demonstrate when they're looking to get support for their student? Um, on, on rare occasions at this point, to be honest with you, Debbie, but what I will say is even if a student isn't approved for accommodations the first time, there are opportunities to appeal that decision. So you can make it you know, clear if it wasn't clear enough for College Board or ACT the first time around and really explain this is why there's not a longstanding IEP. And I think if you communicate that effectively, I, I do think these that the testing that College Board and ACT are reasonable and understanding and they get it because they've worked with plenty of homeschool students and families over the years. So they understand the differences in those cases. Great. Okay. So let's talk about the other piece that I think is on a lot of parents' minds in this application process. And that is the essay. I know for a lot of kids who struggle with writing, whether it's because of executive functioning challenges uh, processing speed issues and just having trouble getting thoughts from their mind onto paper or other learning disabilities. Talk about how students can kind of tackle that essay. Do you have any best practices surrounding that? And then any thoughts that might specifically relate to supporting differently wired kids? Absolutely. So I think, especially for differently wired students, and quite frankly, anyone who doesn't love writing if, and writing about themselves, one piece of assurance that I always give to students and families heading into this process is that while good writing is a foundational piece of a good college essay, the best essays aren't the ones that are the best written or read like Shakespeare wrote them, right? The best essays are the ones that are the most personal. And what's nice about the college application essays is this isn't your five, you know, quote unquote, five paragraph standardized essay from school. Students are liberated to share their personal voice in their own style. There's no format that they need to accommodate. So to take a lot of the pressure and um, stress away from initial, you know, especially that first draft, which is very scary for anyone when you're looking at that blank sheet of paper, that blank template on your computer screen. Our advice is to just start writing and not worry about the word limits. Just get your thoughts and ideas on paper. Sometimes that can be full sentences that are grammatically correct, but in those initial one or two drafts, we joke with students all the time, don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about spelling. The idea here is to get your thoughts and your stories and emotions onto the page so we can look at them. And then that's what revisions are for. And then honing that story down and really making sure we do capture the student's voice, you know, in the required word limit space. But I think that a lot of students do come into this thinking, oh, this is another five paragraph essay for English class where there's that rubric where I need a thesis statement. And it's not true. You really are liberated and unbound to express your voice in telling your personal story. And I guess it would depend on the school, what types of personal stories or expressions that school values. I mean, is the, I'm assuming there's not kind of one standard, you know, triumph over a challenging childhood or, you know, a formula that schools are looking for? Right. So first of all, there's a lot of different types of college application essay prompts out there. So if we want to break them down into two categories, there's one essay that is called the personal statement. Um, interchangeably, some people will call it the common app essay because you have this common application, which students will use for 
probably the majority of colleges that they apply to. And on the Common App, there's this personal statement, which is a one page, 650 word essay. And there's seven topics this year. And and they, there's some specificity to them. There are topics like tell us about a challenge that you've encountered or an obstacle you've encountered and how you overcome it. Um, You can also tackle a question like tell us about a time that you challenged a belief or idea. What did you do about it? What prompted you to take action? But believe it or not, one of the seven prompts is just topic of your choice, write about anything. So that's that main essay where the prompts are really loose guidelines and ideas that get you started. Then the rest of the essays can be grouped under a category called supplemental essays. And those vary by college and university. So some schools like a Northeastern University in Boston or University of Miami, Miami and Florida have zero supplement essays at all. Uh, and then you have a school like Wake Forest University that has seven supplement essays, uh, including a prompt. Uh, this isn't as much of an essay prompt necessarily, but I always think this one's fun. It just says, give us your top 10 list. But the prompts can range from asking about a student's intellectual interest uh, to a community they belong to and their role within it to their personal diversity and how they've embraced that. So there's really a wide range of prompts out there. But no matter what the prompt is, Debbie, uh, I have students brainstorm the same way for all the questions because really these questions are all opportunities and invitations for a student to share their story, uh, which is why when I'm brainstorming with students, I only ask them one question, which is, what do I need to know about you? And that's a very overwhelming and intentionally broad question. But I don't want students only thinking through the lens of what a prompt may be asking, because I think that limits the stories that they share and open up to tell. When you ask, what do I need to know about you, as big of a question as that is, it really invites a cool conversation where students can talk about uh, things from their resume, like activities and accomplishments and awards. And another place, which I always say, there's two places ideas come from, your resume and your eulogy. And I don't mean to sound morbid in saying that, but when we think about what would be on a eulogy that wouldn't be on a resume, it would be a lot of the intangibles, like important or meaningful moments and stories in a student's life, obstacles that they've overcome, uh, quirks, interests, curiosities, traditions that they have. And when I'm working with a student, I want to know all of that going into the process before they ever start drafting an essay so that we can talk you know, really evaluate and think about what stories they feel are most important to share. We'll be right back after this quick break. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. 
However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast. Okay, so we've talked about grades, we've talked about tests, we've talked about essays. So then there's the intangible, there's the the whole person. Um, Can you talk about the interests, the passions, the ways that kids can best share who they are, um, and, and kind of what they bring to a university, and how they can give insight to that piece of them that that could really spark a, a college's interest? Sure. So working backwards, I always tell students and families, there's really three areas on the application that you have control over where you can really share your student's story beyond grades and an academic transcript and standardized test scores. So one of those uh, ways that you can share your voice is obviously the application essays, which we were just talking about. Uh, In in fact, that's really the one opportunity that students have to share their personal voice on the application. Uh, Another way that they can do this is teacher and guidance counselor recommendations, which some parents and students always find a little funny that I say that you, you know, quote unquote, have control over this. Uh, But you really kind of do because it's on the student to develop and foster a relationship with their teachers and with a guidance counselor. And the guidance counselor is actually required to write a letter of recommendation for every single one of their students. And having these third parties help share and illuminate your child's story and their journey can be very impactful on an application. And then, of course, the last way that you can share your story and the, of the intangibles on the application is through the activity list, which, you know, is essentially a collection and, you know, report of a student's extracurricular endeavors throughout high school. And, you know, you talk about how things have changed over the years. And I think for a lot of parents, there's this idea that back in the day, maybe colleges wanted to see students do a little bit of everything. They wanted to see leadership and creative pursuits, volunteering and service, uh, maybe having a job or an internship. And I think what's happening more nowadays is that colleges do still want to see all those things, but what they really appreciate is really seeing synergies in a student's life so they can really understand who that child is and what they're all about. Uh, There's a movie that came out a few years ago starring Tina Fey and Paul Rudd called It Mission, which, you know, the plot of the movie is somewhat irrelevant, um, but Tina Fey in the movie is an admissions officer. And there's a scene where every time she opens up an application file, the student pops up in the room with her. And I think that's an important image for families and students uh, who are trying to understand the college application and college prep process is the fact that admissions officers are people and people accept other people. They want to be able to envision you in the room with them. So uh, I gave a TED talk last September and an example I gave in my TED talk about a really great way to think about extracurricular pursuits is if your son or daughter comes home one day and tells you mom or dad that they want to start a rock band in the garage. And I, I joke that 
with parents all the time. I'm like, let's be honest. What's your initial reaction if your child says that? And I think when we parent from a place of fear as opposed to possibility, a lot of moms and dads are like, well, if you're looking to get into a selective university, it's probably a waste of time. Or they're just dreading hearing their child banging on the drums at two in the morning and keeping them up at night. Um, But when we think about that proclamation from your son or daughter from a place of possibility, you can say, well, my child is starting a band. That means that they have leadership initiative. And it also must mean they have creative musical talent if they can start a band. It also means that they have the ability to collaborate and work well with others. It means that if they are writing their own songs, that that's a different sort of creative pursuit uh, with lyrics and poetry. And then if the band starts playing shows around town, If they get paid for some, that's a job. Uh, If they start playing charity gigs, that's community service. Uh, Maybe your child ends up learning HTML programming to code and design uh, the band's website. Or maybe they start giving music lessons to other younger children in town, and that's another job. There's so many opportunities to, quote unquote, check off all those boxes that colleges have wanted for years. The leadership and service and collaboration, et cetera. Um, What I try to emphasize to every family, and especially families who are just entering or starting high school, is that when we talk about what can I do for my child or what are the conversations I should be having at home with my ninth or 10th grader, Of course, it's obvious to talk about the importance of them keeping up their grades and doing their schoolwork, but it's also engaging your son or daughter in conversations about what are their interests, what are their curiosities, and I always hesitate to use the word passion. Certainly, some students have a passion, sometimes multiple, but I think even there's a lot of adults in the world who may not have a passion and That's why I try to take that pressure off of students when we have those conversations is there there may not be something that is their end all be all in life, but they may have lots of curiosities and lots of things that pick their interest and get that, you know, spark and glimmer in their eye and having those conversations and talking about ways to do a deeper dive or take an interest to the next level, to engage in it more meaningfully and purposefully. I think that that's one of the best things about the high school experience is it does present opportunities and it encourages students to engage in what's meaningful to them on deeper levels. I love that. And I love the example you shared about the band. That makes total sense. And I'm wondering then how are those skills, those interests that, you know, they, there was a job and uh, business and HTML and all these different pieces, how would that information be conveyed throughout the application process? Sure. So essays on the activity list, they give you the opportunity to write a description of your roles within a commitment or organization or endeavor. Uh, and write a brief summary. Uh, Some colleges and universities will give you the opportunity to upload a resume, which gives you the space to include more details. There also is an additional information section on the Common App and many other universities' applications where it's not intended, and admissions officers don't want another essay there. But when there are extenuating circumstances, when a student has done something or engaged in an activity in such a deep way that uh, I think it's on the activity descriptions on the common app, I think you're limited to 150 characters, right? So you could joke that's about the length of a tweet, which sometimes that's sufficient, but in many cases it's not. So to have that additional information section to really elaborate and include more bullet points or details that illuminate and shed light on 
the true depth of how a student has engaged in that. There, there's always ways and opportunities. And if the space provided to you isn't enough, uh, there's certainly ways to create more space or make sure that you communicate everything appropriately to an admissions officer so they can fully appreciate what your child has done. So for parents who are listening to this and maybe they, they have middle schoolers or, or high school students, what's kind of the one thing you, you want them to take away from this conversation? Any kind of one key piece of advice or something they should start thinking about if maybe they're feeling overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh, I'm behind, you know, I should have been doing this already. What's your piece of advice to them? My piece of advice is knowing how to navigate this process, like I said before, is more than half the battle. And understanding that there is a lot to navigate and it's important to have conversations and get good information not from a place of fear, but from a place of being able to plan ahead. There's a lot of myths and bad information out there. And it doesn't come from a malicious place or even, a, it's not even fear mongering either. It's just that some people aren't always aware of, of the intricacies of how the system works and the different rules at different schools. And if you take the time to have the conversations and plan ahead, I'd say that is the biggest key takeaway. Uh, when I am like when I'm doing seminars and webinars with families who are just starting high school, one thing I always say is there's nothing to take action on immediately necessarily. When you're a parent of a ninth grade student, the messages to your child are, keep up your grades and let's have conversations about your extracurriculars and how you want to engage in the world. You shouldn't be doing SAT and ACT prep in ninth grade. Certainly college essays and applications, while you can keep that in the back of your head, that's not something to really worry about because you're not going to be writing those essays until probably the summer before 12th grade. So there's an opportunity to ease in this into this process. But I think when I talk to parents of ninth graders and they say, we don't want to have this conversation now with you. We want our child to just enjoy high school and not think about college. I, I think that's missing the point of the best way to engage in the high school experience. Because when you come from a place that every activity, if you think of about that and your mentality is, well, I'm just doing these things for college, then you're already doing them wrong because then you're focusing on the idea of being a better applicant and not using the high school experience as a way to make your child a better person. And I think that's probably the biggest takeaway I would want families to have is it's okay to have these conversations because there's a lot of opportunities for growth throughout the whole high school experience, culminating with those college essays and applications when students ultimately are writing essays that need to be based in what do I need to know about you, the person who's evolved and matured and grown over the past three or four years. And too often I see students and families look at those essay prompts with the mentality of what do colleges want to hear about me? And I think that subtle difference is so important for families to understand going into the process uh, if they want to make the most out of the high school experience. That's great. Thank you. Super helpful. So tell us how we can connect with you. You mentioned your webinars and online offerings. So what's the best way for parents to engage with you and what can they expect when they go to your site? Absolutely. So my company is called Ivy Experience. Our website is myivyexperience.com. And uh, what you'll find on our website beyond an outline of the services that we offer families, 
uh, is also uh, some great resources, uh, blog posts to educate families throughout the process, and of course, a contact form. And when you reach out to us, uh, I've made a hallmark of my company. I've always believed in growth by education. Uh, I think that there's too often this idea that some of this information about how to navigate the college prep process should be a secret that you need to access. And when families reach out to us, we are eager and excited to answer all of their questions and you know ease any anxieties to help them navigate this process and start thinking about it and planning ahead for their child uh, in the ways that are best for their family. Great. Well, thank you. Um, listeners, I will leave links to Eric's website and the other resources that we talked about on the show notes page for this episode. So definitely check those out. I'm going to be checking them out after I was on this and prep for the interview, but now I want to go back and dive a little deeper into your blog posts. This has been super insightful and yeah, and actually calming, you know, I do think there's a lot of stress and anxiety that parents experience when they start even thinking about these conversations and and what's coming up for our kids. So I really just love your approach. It feels really, it feels uh, like there's room, you know, to kind of navigate it and to, to move through it in a way that that has possibility as at its roots instead of fear, as you said. So um, thank you so much for taking the time and, and sharing all this with us today. Thank you, Debbie. Really appreciate you inviting me to talk with you. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. For the show notes for this episode, including a link to Eric's website, his consulting organization, The Ivy Experience, as well as all the other resources we discussed today, visit tiltparenting.com slash session 157. If you want to financially support the production of this show and get some insider glimpses into what happens here in the production of Tilt and in my world uh, with Asher, for the price of a cup of coffee, you can become a patron and help cover the costs. To learn more, just go to patreon.com slash Tilt Parenting. Lastly, don't forget to leave a rating or a review or both for Tilt Parenting on iTunes if you haven't already done so. Ratings and reviews help keep this podcast visible in an ever-growing sea of podcasts. So thank you so much for taking the time to support the show in that way. And that's all for this week. Thanks again for listening. And for more information on Tilt Parenting, visit www.tiltparenting.com. Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? Play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome. Through episodes with me, Christine Co, and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, you'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts.